Welcome to Regis World Literature. This is Lesson 29, Cyrano de Bergerac, and we are beginning with Act 4. Now, in Act 3, we ended by uh, with Christian and Roxanne just having gotten married, and they're on their way to the battlefield. And this is that very same day. Now, meanwhile, they've been at the battlefield now where we open in Act 4, and they've been there long enough that things are going very badly for them. The uh, the French were, of which, of course, Christiane and Cyrano are a part, they were dispatched to surround the city of Arras and hold them under siege. But meanwhile now, the uh, Spanish troops have surrounded them and they are besieging the besieger, so to speak. And so things are going very bad for them. But Cyrano, so they're all pinned down, but Cyrano is going back and forth through the Spanish lines every day, maybe sometimes twice a day, to deliver a letter to Roxanne. And we find out that this is um, the case, and he's he's running back through the lines to get home while they're taking shots at him under gun, gunfire. And he does it, again, because of his devotion. Now, probably he and Christiane are composing some letters together, and he's mailing those, but he's doing much more than that on his own initiative, unknown, unbeknownst to uh, Christian. Now, this speaker is Cordon, the, the leader of the cadets, and he says, what a shameful reversal of order of things, of the order of things, that the besieger should be starved. So this is kind of a plot, quote, telling us what's actually happening on the field. Now, scene two, Carbon, uh, Carbon calls Cyrano from his tent to rally the troops. So he has stumbled into the tent. We think that perhaps he is uh, going to go to sleep in the morning because he's been pretty much up all night. M many of the troops have a uh, very fitful night's sleep, partly because of the danger of the scenario, but also partly because their stomachs are constantly growling and they're under fatigue, poor rest, poor sleep, uh, poor food, that kind of thing. Okay. So Carbon, uh, the, the troops are grumbling as they are trying to get up and rallied for the day, and Carbon calls into the tent for Cyrano to come out to rally the troops, as he is the great morale builder. Because why? Why would Cyrano be equipped to be the morale builder of this group? Think about Cyrano. He's the one who is always perpetually setting himself emotionally and mentally by his will and, and what he chooses. The spin, or quote-unquote, or that might imply just something uh, false, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about a personal worldview. He decides how he views his life. And so because he has such a command over himself, I would suggest this is a very godly quality. We are called to govern our thoughts to tra be transformed by the renewing of our minds. How do we govern our thoughts? We govern our thoughts by scripture, right? We let the scripture tell us what our perspective is. Uh, certain habits, uh, the habit of gratitude is something that's being talked about a lot these days and how uh, even um, many, many books being written about it that we need to learn to cultivate a attitude of gratitude, an attitude of thankfulness, an attitude of appreciation about our lives, not just always what is wrong with our lives or our circumstances. So these are ways you set yourself. Well, Cyrano's very good at this, and that's why he can turn around and set the hearts and minds of others to encourage them. So that's a good principle there. So um, the soldiers, he's asking, uh, Carbon is asking Cyrano to encourage them because they're threatening to revolt because of their hunger and frustration. And so they all respond eager to hear him. Yes, Cyrano, tell us again what we're about. And, and many plays, many speeches, many uh, works of literature 
as well as many scenarios in life, reflect the same idea. I'm thinking right now of the movie um, Alamo, The Alamo, and right the night before, uh, they're expecting that they will probably all be dead the next day. You know, They have this time where they're playing the music, they're singing softly together, they're remembering home, and they're talking about the things they value. Okay, and this is not an uncommon idea. So the men respond with eagerness. They respect his voice. They respond to it. They say, to the rescue, Cyrano. Now the cadets will not be distracted or soothed by Cyrano's whip this time because um, he's, as he's trying to entertain them. So instead he moves to strategy number two. He calls the fifer to play a melody that would remind them of home. Okay. And he gives this quote to explain it. And this is where, I, where it does remind me of the Alamo or many other scenes you see. Um, but it says, homesickness, a nobler pain than hunger. Why? It's not physical, but mental. I am glad that the seat of their suffering should have removed that the gripe should now afflict their hearts. Isn't that interesting? So what is, I mean, we could argue back and forth, you know, and there's certainly a, a physical pain is not trivial, but he's saying this is that priority of the internal man. That's what we're seeing in this quote. He's saying the internal is more important than the external. So we elevate, this is a good understanding of, of how Cyrano views life. He elevates a pain, gives it a nobler perspective when, it sa when he says it is the pain of the heart and not just the body. <laughs> you might pause and consider that yourself. You might think, is that the way I view it? Okay. But this is definitely the way Cyrano views it. De Guiche finally arrives then and now de Guiche, remember, is the commander of the entire army all around the field. He comes and checks on these guys. He arrives. He's also pale and suffering, uh, not getting food and supplies himself. And they, remember, there's always this uh, conflict between the cadets and de Guiche. And so they quickly brush aside their their melancholy and their sadness, and they put on this show of bravado. And Cyrano says, let us not appear to suffer either. Okay. Because they do not want to, they want to only put, put on their bra bravery before de Guiche. Now in scene four, de Guiche speaks of yesterday's incident on the battlefield where he left his wife's white scarf. He, it flew, flew off as he was running, I guess, and he left it there on the field. The white scarf was the indication of his rank, and he left it there to escape the field, or maybe he actually unwrapped it and dropped it so that as they're firing, you know, if we we assume we're firing at the commander, of course he's a great target because he will demoralize the troops if you manage to kill the opposing commander. So he might have actually dropped it on purpose, so that he could more easily escape, and lead. And his, in fact, I think that is exactly what happened. And he wants to be able to survive so that he can lead his men later to defeat the Spanish. Now, he views this, this is very important, as wisdom and not as shame. You know, to, to live to fight another day would be the common quote. So he is actually maybe perhaps even bragging about this incident. I left my field. Did you hear about what I did yesterday? I left the field. I dropped my scarf so that they would not fire at me. I could escape and lead my men another day. Okay. So now, would that be the way Cyrano would view this? We know Cyrano. Okay. No, Cyrano would never do that. He views it as relinquishing, and here again, that word panache. He says he's relinquishing his white 
plume. Remember, pl uh, panache on one side, uh, in one sense, just means that fancy feather that's coming outside of the hat or the helmet of a knight, and it shows his um, his self confidence, his pride of place and person and skill, all these things. Okay. He says, one should not resign the honor of being a target. He says, I would have picked it up and worn it. Had I been there, I would have grabbed it and put it on. Total different attitudes here. There's, uh, in some ways, you could probably understand both positions. Do you think he was bragging? Or do you think it was true? What do you think? Had Cyrano been there? Would he have chosen the, uh, perhaps the place of cautious wisdom to run with the geese, support him to come and attack again the next day? Or would he have picked it up and worn it? Well, I think we've seen enough of Cyrano to support uh, a position there. Cyrano produces the scarf. Guess what? He produces the scarf then, which de Guiche uses to... Okay, so let's talk about that before we go on. He produces the scarf. Where did he get the scarf? When he was running through the lines to deliver the letter to Roxanne. Again, that same sense of what might be called foolish bravery. Some people would look at these things. We see this today. We see this all the time. An action that somebody takes, one person would evaluate as foolish bravado, and the other person would evaluate as admirable courage. So he pulls it up out. Now, can you imagine what de Guiche is thinking Just at this point? See, again, this contradiction of values that puts these two men so opposed to one another. They drive each other crazy because they see the world from two different directions. Well, de Guiche grabs the scarf. He's rather indignant. Maybe feels a little shame at this. Maybe not. Maybe he just thinks, you fool. But he grabs it and he waves signals to whom? A spy in the Spanish camp. He knows that they're going to head a battle today and he's going to signal where it would be both most advantageous to the French troops if they would concentrate their focus there. So he's signaling to a spy within the Spanish camp saying, shoot here, make your breach here. That's the least costly to us. And of course, he doesn't like the cadets. He was debating which would be the best place for them to break through if they must. And so the Spaniards, he decides to attack here. Why? Probably because of his offense, even in this moment with Cyrano. These two men are like um, rams uh, lined up against each other, and they can almost not help themselves. They keep bashing heads. Okay, Christian grieves that he cannot write one letter to Roxanne. So these men know now that they're basically on a suicide mission. They're going to be attacked within a very short period of time here, maybe an hour to get themselves ready. And Christian says he grieves that he cannot write one more one letter to Roxanne expressing his love before he dies. Cyrano produces a letter <laughs> from his coat and gives it to Christian. He says, here, take this one. Now, where, where, where did that one come from? He'd just come from passing through the Spanish lines, having delivered another, and he went immediately to his tent. And while Carbon calls him out, thinking he must have been sleeping, he was writing another letter. So we're seeing the depths of Cyrano's emotion, even though he's on the battlefield, his heart and mind are preoccupied with Roxanne at all points. Now, Christian grabs it, and he notices a tear on it, okay. a tear mark. And he says, well, where did you get this letter? Oh, a poet, a poet always has a few love letters on hand. And he notices the poet, and he, or the, the tear, and he looks up. Christian looks up at Cyrano, 
and he says, well, the, well, what is this tear here? You know, and he barely denies, Cyrano barely denies his emotion here. And then a, a coach comes driving into the camp, lots of hubbub here, and says, service of the king, service of the king, and who could it be but Roxanne and Ragano? And they have filled the, the coach with victuals, with food and drink, and have... Uh, brought it to the troops they know are starving and under great duress and have dared to tr travel all the way through the Spanish lines to do this. And, of course, we'll learn how she's able to pull that off okay. in a moment. But let's go ahead and write a couple ideas here. I think this idea of panache, one more time, being, being tickled on here because this is the undercurrent symbol so to speak, of this play. Now, before we leave scene four, let's linger uh, just a little bit on this statement, which in my book is found on page 130. It says, he would never, he's talking to De Guiche in this conversation, he would never relinquish his white plume, his panache. Panache is the exact word that's used in French there in the original play. Now, so we tend to have a couple different interpretations of panache. He would never relinquish his white plume. It could be your bravado, the show you're putting before the world. Or it could be your essence, your essential sense of strength and being, your identity. And so it tends to start from one sense of the meaning and move towards the other as the play progresses in the way I read it and understand it. So my question is then, can we say that about anything? Can you say that about anything? Something you would never relinquish. What is your white plume, so to speak? That thing you will not part with. The thing that is the most essentially you, but not private, inward, and hidden from others, but the thing that is mo most essentially you, that you would be willing to wear always on as a medallion on your, um, on your coat or always as a large and noticeable feather in your hat. It defines you. What defines you that you would not let go of under any circumstances? That's the question. The second way to interpret that question is, what makes you most essentially you? That if you were to let go of that, you would let go of all. And you would not be who you are. You would be something else. I lay that question out for you. Think that through. Because he has a very, Cyrano has a very strong sense of what he most values. And I might ask you that question on your Cyrano test. What does he most value? All right, you think that through. Well, let's look. move on to scene five now. Uh, service of the King of Love. She's traveled through, this is Roxanne with the coach, has traveled through the enemy lines with her, how'd she get away with it? With her smile as her passport. I am going to see my lover, she says, and all these lonely soldiers who have been out on the battlefield for way too long smile and applaud. These are the enemy. Right, But any woman who would brace the fields of battle to go and see her lover with supplies, they, they, de they delight in that. It uh, shows you sometimes how much unites us right, as people, even when we're fighting a war, or fighting a battle. Uh, of course, um, many, many stories are made of this. Many ideas are presented in literature and in history and, and we recognize that true. We recognize that there are things we identify and value and applaud in one another, even across enemy lines. And this 
is just one more of those. Okay, love, the the king of love. They all try to persuade her, meaning uh, the cadets, to leave because they know the battle is imminent, but she refuses. Well, all the cadets are motivated by her courage. They straighten up their appearance. They quickly try to smudge the dirt off their faces, brush their hair back, uh, button up, look the best they can, because, of course, this is a woman and a young and beautiful woman in their midst, and, and they're just responding to that. They want to put on their best step forward, their best appearance. So they, they may, um, as, as they prepare to be introduced to her, as those who are about to die one by one. She asks for all the provisions to be brought from the coach. They're amazed as, as one thing after another. And, and Edmund Rostand, you can just imagine him as the artist enjoying this part as he describes how each one thing, each bit of provision is cleverly uh, disguised or hidden in different parts of the coach. Ragano has helped to prepare the feast, and he is there with her. Cyrano, although all this time, now everybody's just kind of enchanted by her. She's drawing all the attention. But Cyrano keeps trying to draw Christian aside because he has something to tell him. De Guiche returns, and they quickly hide the feast again. Now, remember that de Guiche also likes Roxanne. And he is shocked to see her there, but he tries to get her to leave again. And in that, her, uh, Cyrano, Christian, the cadets, and the Guiche all agree Roxanne should leave the battlefield, that recognizing that it's going to be very dangerous in a very short time, and she will not need, none of them will likely survive it. Well, Roxanne refuses to leave, and so de Guiche does the first perhaps noble thing we've seen in the entire play regarding him. He says, well, then I will not leave either. I will remain to help defend her. And all of a sudden, de Guiche, who's the despicable one that we have scorned this entire play, has turned around in our minds. We thought, wow. So that must have been something more than a trivial affection. He's actually showing true courage now, true bravery, and true affection for her. Well, Cyrano recognizes that. Maybe before any of the others does, he says, at last, monsieur, an instance of pure and simple bravery. So he essentially, if he had his big hat with his fancy plume on, he would have tipped it down like the musketeer, swept it to the ground, and bowed before de Guiche. This is a true word of honor from Cyrano to de Guiche. And then he says, you know, a man, he's acting like a, finally, he, he um, owns his heritage. He is a cadet of Gascony, and they applaud him, and they share their uh, offer to share the feast with him. To Christian, he says, "You um, remember he's been trying to get his attention before the battle beat commences, and he says, Christian, come over here. I need to talk to you. You, I want you to know if she asks you about the letters you have written." to her oftener than you suppose. Well, what do you mean by that? You know, how often? Three times a week? Four times a week? Is this more? More? Every day? Yes, uh, twice a day. So all this time they've been at the battlefield, Cyrano has been writing twice a day to Roxanne. Now, how would you feel if you were Christian? He's already allowed you to play a role. You've, you've made this perfect hero of romance together, but now you are married and this is your wife. How would you feel if this other man who is supposed to only be helping you word, put beautiful words 
to your love letters, you now figure out that he maybe you've mailed one once a week and he's mailed one twice a day and has traveled through the lines to make sure it gets to her. Well, what, what would you feel? What do you think about that? Is it, oh, thank you, Serena. What a great guy you are. You, you must really like her too. And wait a minute, these are love letters you've written to her. This is my wife you're writing love letters to without my knowledge. Well, this doesn't feel honorable at all, does it? From Christian's standpoint, he's angry, he's furious. And you cared so much about it that you were willing to brave death? See, the light dawns, doesn't it? He's been suspicious once or twice, but now he recognizes Cyrano loves Roxanne. He's never really, we've never really gotten to that point in this play yet. Cyrano loves Roxanne, and Christian knows it. Okay. So now this is a breach of faithfulness, isn't it? I mean, Roxanne doesn't know. Roxanne assumes these letters are from Christian. But all of a sudden, there's a great breach between these two. <laughs> Tangled web, isn't it? Well, Roxanne interrupts the scene before they can get any further. So we are going to wrap up part one right now and then come back with part two on scene eight today. And so go ahead and look for that tape also and make sure that you, of course, finish these notes, get them all. Remember, you're responsible not just to listen and understand the lecture, but to make sure that you write all the notes down in your notebook. So we'll meet you back in part two.